Welcome everybody. My name is Peggy Compton. I'm with the University of Wisconsin Extension and a member of ESP's National Professional Development Committee. It's my pleasure to be with you today. And first of all, welcome you. I'm glad to have you join us. And also my pleasure to introduce our presenters for today. This is the second webinar in our short series. Uh, this is something that the Professional Development Committee has really been working on putting together more um, more opportunities for our members. We hope that many of you will consider also coming to our national conference in North Carolina in October, but many people can't make the, the trip to our national conferences, so this from the Professional Development Committee is our way of also trying to offer this very important opportunity for professional development to all members, even if you can't come to the national conferences. So uh, thank you for joining us for our second in our short series of webinars. Our presenters today, Jody Hornbent and Tobias Spanier from the University of Minnesota Extension. They are with the Center for Community Vitality in the University of Minnesota Extension and working on leadership and civic engagement. They have been programming together since 2011, where they work with NELD, and maybe many of you have heard of that, the National Extension Leadership Development Program. So again, welcome to Jody and Toby, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say for us today. Thank you. And so thanks for that intro, Peggy. Um, and uh, just to share a little bit, uh, we've been programming an extension longer than that, um, just uh, programming together with the National Extension Leadership Development Program since that time. Um, I, I, the years add up in terms of the number of years in which we've been involved in uh, various roles and places. But today, um, we're just glad everyone's able to be here. I do recognize a lot of the, the names in the chat pod, so that's really fun to see uh, some of the names of people that I've um, met over the years, as well as some new names there. So it's, it's always good to, to meet people. Did, anything you wanted to share, Toby, as we get started? No, just uh, thank you for being on this webinar. Welcome, and uh, great to see those names that I know, and looking forward to meeting some new people via the technology today. And so uh, with Jerry, that... Jody, let me jump in real quick. I'm sorry. I, I think maybe you've got some chat and things that are up on the screen. There's a few blank spots in, in the slides. Oh, that so if that's open, that shows. Yeah, well, it sort, okay. sort of shows. It's repainting the screen, and it's sort of so if you can either slide them off. If you want to slide them off onto your other monitor, I think that would be fine, or, or just, just close them. So I close them, and, and I'll uh, allow everyone else to let me know um, if someone's chatted something. So I'll leave it at that so I don't uh, mess those things up. But thanks, Mark, I didn't realize that. I'm not used to using Zoom. In Minnesota, we use WebEx, and we use uh, Google and Hangouts, and have used other technologies, but Zoom is a new one for me, so I'm always uh, up for a challenge. But uh, that said, I, I chose the image on the screen um, with the, the curtains there, and uh, this notion of uh, program design strategies to increase you know, part, participant capacity is really about kind of pulling the curtain back and going behind the curtain of programming. Many times participants see and experience what's happening in the room in the teaching moment. And this uh, session today is really pulling the curtain back to look at the four S's of program design and development that we uh, follow when we're doing our programs. So that said, I'm going to invite you, um, if I might, to uh, in the chat pod, uh, discuss or share with us just what approach do you take to design, develop, and evaluate your programs? So sort of a warm-up today to get our brains thinking about program de design and development. And uh, if you would pop some ideas there into the chat pod and how you approach it, I'll count on Toby to then uh, lift some of the highlights off of that. Unless, as Mark says, I'm able to put it in my other window. So let me just see if I can drag it over yeah, there. Yeah, give that a try. I, I think that'll work fine. I apologize then for not looking directly at people in the camera, but I guess I can see it over there. Perfect. Yeah. Everyone's thinking and not jumping in. So uh, typically when Toby and I do webinars, if you've ever experienced any of ours, we, uh, we don't see them as just a one-way direction from us to you, but we uh, actually feed off and like to uh, build off of what uh, people in the room contribute because we believe everyone um, has many gifts and talents and knowledge that uh, can add value to our experience as well. So, uh, so needs assessment, a backward design, some, some great examples coming in there. If you would uh, 
just remind people to reply and share with all all with everyone on the list um, instead of just panelists that would be a, a nice thing so everyone can see your responses so and that notion of building in active learning um, is something that was mentioned there asset based needs to, asset based needs assessment okay great And I would say that those things we take into those into consideration as we're developing and designing our programs, we're going to inc include a couple other levels um, and angles for looking at program um, design that may be new to you or it may be um, something you've thought about but never really had a name for it or, uh, or don't call it what we call it. And uh, we're going to emphasize this notion of scaffold scope, sequence, and strategies. And um, to, to preface that a little bit, we did want to share that within the University of Minnesota, within our Center for Community Vitality, our leadership programs have started using this concept of scaffolding scope, sequence, and strategy oh, about 2012, 2011, somewhere in there, to really think about how we design our curriculum. And what's key to this is it builds off a competency-based model for our leadership education that we adopted about that time. And when Toby uh, shares slides in just a couple of minutes, he's gonna talk a little bit more about competency-based models for education. So I wanted to preface that and just uh, note that that's what we base it off of. So the, the, the quick overview of what we're gonna cover today is really, we're gonna cover those four S's and like, please explain more. Um, that's what we're gonna try to do, uh, get into that a bit to be able to share some of those insights. The example that we're gonna use um, though we do this with our other programs, the one we're going to use is the NELD program, which is National Extension Leadership Development um, in the North Central Region, which covers the, the 12 state states in the, in the North Central Region of the U.S. And uh, each year there are extension professionals who take part in that program. And so we're going to be using that as our example to describe um, the four S's and how we use them. And just to say a bit more about NELD, it really is... Um, the goal is to build leaders within extension at all levels, um, provide them with vision, courage, tools to lead in a changing world. And what it is, it's four sessions that take place uh, between January and September each year um, in four separate locations, multiple days. Uh, the minimum number of days is four, I believe, that we're together, upwards to uh, just over a week when we do an international uh, session and uh, head out of country to uh, actually begin um, and practice some of the skills that we're learning um, in that way. And I believe Toby's going to say a little bit more about um, that session in particular when he gets into his portions. So once we're done uh, sharing some of those examples around the S's um, using NELD as that piece, we're going to share some insights with you about impacts, about how it's changed, how we think about our programming, and actually share a few tools and tips with you um, and uh, provide some links where you might even download and look at some of our examples. So that said, here they are, the overview of the four S's. Um, and this, uh, this concept uh, actually was brought to us by a leadership specialist we had at the time uh, back in, you know, in 2012 who uh, brought this concept of the four S's to program development to us. And it really resonated with us and made great sense. And that was um, Denise Trudeau-Paskas. I've cited uh, one of her papers there that we uh, still to this day reference and refer to as we do that. So now I'm going to turn it over to Toby. Thank you, Jody. And Jody's uh, sharing her screen today, so I'm going to have to ask her from time to time to advance the slides. But um, thank you for that overview, Jody. And I'm going to touch upon the first two S's in this uh, model. And the first one is scaffolding or to, to scaffold the program. And I actually think I, I really enjoy the metaphor here around the construction scaffold because it's a critical process that builds the foundation to the top of a program. And scaffolding is that process where uh, that outlines the overall structure and integration between the content the time and the scope. I'll talk about scope uh, in the next slide or so, but the first step to any scaffolding is to really analyze and examine uh, the key elements of an audience of the program. And many of you in your chat were probably re referencing, I think, your analysis or your examination of both the key elements of a program or an audience. Uh, for us, that happens first, and then the process of scaffolding begins around what we've discovered um, based on that examination or analysis. 
for us, the key material in our programs are the competencies. And so I'm going to say a few words about competencies uh, now. So if Jody wants to advance. Uh, so you see the screen here, it says, what are competencies? That refers to the concrete observable behavior or skill as applied to a, applied to a certain role. And um, a competency model is a set of skills and behaviors or competencies that are required for excellent performance in a specific role. And we adopted a competency model um, you know, back, as Jody said, back in 2012 or so, a little before then even. And a good competency model leads to deeper meaning, to training, covering not only the knowledge and the aspirations, but also some measurable behaviors and skills. And so that really changed the way we approached, I think, the particular program we're going to talk about, but it has changed the programming we've done in other areas as well. Um, really since the 1990s, uh, the companies have become the focus of many leadership education programs. You may have heard about them in your own state, um, originating from a strong need by business really to produce better performance and results. They began this idea of competencies. And now competencies are our basis for leadership programs, not only for business, but communities, government, agencies, nonprofit organizations, and many other groups as well. Uh, there are many benefits to using a competency model to guide training programs, such as the ones that we're going to describe. Uh, uh, some of the things that have been known to be true are, are that you can accelerate the learning, you can identify skills that have to be developed, and you can provide actionable strategies that empower the participants, create new practices, and finally enhance the leadership and followership effective, effectiveness. And I think uh, that's based on research, but we have found that to be true, and I think in the program that we're going to describe a little bit more. In the NEL program, or in our programs overall, we have these four competency areas uh, that are our focus. And at the center of that, the four what, are the items that you see highlighted in green here. And that is to, to serve others, to have reflection, and to transform oneself and others as part of the four what do we do leadership development. Um, so Jody, if you want to advance to the next slide. So here are again our leadership, the core areas of our leadership competency, leader attributes, relationships, environment, thinking or cognitive practice. I'm gonna describe them just a little bit. What you're seeing underneath each of those categories are the competencies that we, we teach to in our programming. And so the leader, leadership attributes are areas that will build knowledge, perspective and strategies in developing strong leadership capacities. Participants would learn how to develop a personal vision, identify ethical principles, value diversity, and some of the more innovative practices in the field of positive psychology. The relationship or leader member interconnection capacity area or competency area is really around relationship building because we see that as a, as a critical um, component or critical element of leadership. Workshops will build upon the foundation that is important to study good followership here and how to motivate other, others in order to make change and lead well. The environment or the context, contextual understanding competency area really is a area that encompasses knowledge and strategies for understanding and leading community or organizational organizations effectively. So it's about understanding the context well, understanding the processes to use in moving through change. And the last competency area that I'll identify here is around cognitive practice. And it is about those who are interested in being an effective leader or follower, these areas or these workshops will help you acquire skills and formulate strategies in the areas of framing, decision making and questioning and they all generally focus around you know, how to how to become a better critical thinker. So Jody if you want to go to the next slide um, you saw the competency areas and the competency the, the subscales underneath each of the each of these competency areas. What you see now on the slide are the ones that Jody and I in our in our scaffolding process identified as most important for the the NELD program uh, in a given year. And every year we review these and identify based on evaluation work and experiences throughout the NELD year to determine what to add or what to replace. So Jody, if you wanna to go to the next slide. So that was a little bit about the overall process of scaffolding. The scope really is all about the time. The less time uh, results in a decreased ability to move from the content focus to the application focus. Remember, on average, an adult learner uh, must practice a skill at least three times for it to become somewhat routine for them, and over 20 times before it becomes a behavior. So on the next slide, you will see how Jody and I have taken, for example, two competencies 
in the competency area of leader member interconnection. We've taken followership and group dynamics and have them spread out across the program year, given the different sessions and webinars that are provided, and have identified what's the depth and the breadth of our programming in those competency areas. And you see an S or a W, which really for us just means is that do we consider that a strong or weak with regard to our kind of intentionality around that, that competency. And we haven't, I guess, really uh, defined what strong and weak means, but for us it means that there's probably some intentional teaching uh, or activities directly related to that particular competency area. And weak means that it's a lighter touch, that there might be a process of, uh, of an activity that somehow we can pull, us, pull the group back toward self-reflection around that to make some meaning on how that relates to the competency rather than directly teaching to that particular learning objective. So those are the first two areas of the four S's. I'll now turn it over to Jody to continue on the process of describing the next two. Jody, you're muted. There we go. I didn't want to be on when Toby was on and have my mic on. Uh, just to recap quick, you know, that scaffolding is knowing the, the main core of what you want to teach. And then when we get to this scope, um, know that when we um, have the entire sheet mapped out with all of the competencies, that there are some areas that we do not touch on, for example, in our first session. Um, because there's just not enough time to go deeply on that. Or we might introduce it. And I, I, sh I share that with this visual on the screen because of what I'm going to share with you next about the next one of the S's. That it is really about being intentional about where we're going to insert it into the program. So that said, um, the, the next, next of the S's is sequence. And that's really the order um, in which we're going to deliver the content. And it's, it's a bit different than um, what Toby was just sharing with the scope. That's sort of the, the bigger picture about sequence. You know, it's not about sequencing it as much as it is just determining where we're going to interject that into the program. But when we think about the sequence, it's about how we work our way into that. And so there are times when we want to go do that light touch and just briefly mention a topic or one of the competencies and do that work at a level of awareness when we're doing those pieces of work. And then um, as we move across with webinars as uh, opportunities for people to go a little bit deeper and deepen their understanding on pieces, um, that would be at that comprehension level. And then we move to practice opportunities within our trainings to be able to try those things on, see how that works, um, you know, apply it in certain ways. And then you move to level four of skill acquisition. So this notion of sequencing is you wouldn't start at level four with skill acquisition. Um, you really want to start with that notion of awareness and where that fits. And to put that in the context of NELD and how we do that, sometimes we do the level one awareness as the introduction to it at a session um, or in a webinar prior to a session, or it might be pre-work. And uh, those who've participated in NELD know that we do assign some pre-work. Maybe it's a journal article to read, or it's something to get people's minds thinking about things. Often people don't um, stop to think about um, a certain elements if they haven't been directed in a, in a direction, you know, to think about followership and what does that look like, for example. Um, so if we uh, do that in pre-work, people come prepared to the session to dig a little deeper so we can get into the comprehension level, not just be, you know, making people aware of it at the session, but we can dig more deeply, more quickly. And so with comprehension, um, we'll use case examples and discussion and other ways of um, digging into things a bit to be able to, uh, you know, a lot of simulations that we'll do um, to really begin to understand the, the content and, and work, work within it. Then when it comes to practice, we, um, on some of those uh, competencies, get into some, you know, planning time, some facilitation time where people actually are teaching each other. Um, they're having conversations in small groups. They're um, engaging to deepen their, not only their comprehension, but to begin practicing those skills. Feedback is one of the things that we teach in this program. And so um, no better way to do that than to practice giving each other feedback at varying points and uh, coach each other on how, how well they did. 
And then at that last level, the skill acquisition, there is that sense of that happening within the sessions, but we also take a look at how does that happen outside of the sessions? Like people go back to their jobs, back to their lives, the context in which they're leading, and uh, get a chance to practice those things and then reflect back on how that's working for them. A little bit later, I'm going to share a tool that would be an example of um, these different levels of awareness, comprehension, practice, and skill acquisition in a link uh, to a teaching uh, activity that you can uh, take a look at when I get a little bit further on into the presentation. Then the last piece is the strategies. And this uh, thing, this piece of this, I think, is really important, and it's the, the lessons. I mean, how they're actually put together and how we actually conduct those trainings. Um, and I know that the, the font is small on this, um, but I wanted to uh, show you like a, a first page of one of our training activities. One of the workshops that we uh, teach at the first session is around the context for leadership. And uh, within that, we use, a, you know, really um, being intentional about what we're going to teach and then paying attention to how you're going to teach it. And so when we think strategies, um, we've, we've gotten to the point of knowing like how we want to teach that. We use a, a multiple media, um, everything from uh, re, you know a slideshow introducing it at the beginning as people are arriving in the room, um, through activities that we might uh, involve people in, conducting interviews, uh, thinking for themselves about how they would define, in this case, leadership and what does it mean to be a leader. Then we'll share some some content, so the forethought things that we put in here are some content sharing. Uh, we'll use recorded presentations, even if we're in the room, uh, let's use some recorded presentations to share that data much more succinctly. And uh, moving our way through that, but it's about being intentional and staging that, paying attention to adult learning uh, strategies, we wanna be mindful of those things. And uh, I think one of the best compliments that I ever received from a participant in the NELD program was when Toby and I, um, it was her observation of Toby and I as we taught and said that even when we weren't um, the one teaching, uh, we were still teaching because we're always on. And they said they'd only experienced co-teaching with, with colleagues where one person was on and the other person was off. And uh, the thing about the teaching in this way is that we engage um, fully, even though one is the lead educator, it's, it's that we're constantly contributing in a way that um, helps the other colleague out, but also adds sort of the value and the examples um, as we work our way through those things. So um, that was the very quick and dirty because we wanted to share other examples about what this really, um, what it really looks like and why, why it makes a difference in our teaching. So um, just to recap, there's the four S's. You have those in front of you, the scaffold scope, um, sequence and uh, the uh, strategies. Sorry, I got that out of order for you. And now we're going to get into a little bit about impact, redesign, and tools and share a few of those uh, pieces. And I will, a uh, little foreshadowing here for you. At the end of each one of these three areas, we are going to pose a question in the chat pod and invite you to reflect on what you've heard. And so as uh, Toby is going to take the section on impact, and we'll be posing a question at the end for you to um, reflect. So that said, there you go, Toby. Thank you, Jody. I'm just going to pause here for a moment. And uh, given the fact that Jody and I have now shared the four S's, um, are there any questions you have about the um, the use or the understanding of what each of the S has brought to uh, the overall design and development and uh, evaluation of, of this particular program? We use it in other programs as well, but in the NELD program. Just so I want to make sure that that is clear and if anybody wants clarification on any of the S's before we kind of jump into the, um, you know, sharing what the S's have done with regard to this one, one particular program. I'm going to pause there and um, see if there's any Q&A in the, in the folder there or any, anyone wants to put a question or a, a statement yet related to the four S's in the chat. Maybe our maybe our description of the of the four S's was so clear that uh, it um, everyone understands uh, exactly how they're uh, utilized by by us in this program. Uh, I, I again kind of go back to the metaphor, um, the importance of having a scaffolding before you start a construction project. It's really that ability to kind of determine, okay, this is where we're going to do our work. I think of a house. So 
we decided we're going to work on this side of the house and the north side of the house, for example. Putting that scaffolding up really helps you understand that this is where you're going to um, invest your time and energy to really work on that side of the house. The scope is uh, looking at that side of the house saying, well, we can't do everything on the exterior, but we're going to work on the windows this summer. And um, the sequence is how you're going to approach those windows. Uh, you know, the scope again might mean, okay, there are windows, but we're going to do some replacement of windows and others windows are just going to paint. The, the sequencing is what's the process there? Are we going to scrape the paint off and then prime and then do the final painting? And the strategy is really, again, the how, the tools you're going to use. And that could be such a thing such as a brush or a roller or whatever you're going to use. And so using that metaphor is one way that helps me understand the importance and the value of using 4S as we design a program and how they all fit together. And we do have a question, Toby. Okay. Question comes um, from Susan. What S does the evaluation fit under or where does evaluation fit with the four S's? Great question. I think it actually fits on, uh, for all of them, but I would say most importantly, probably with the scaffolding. Jody and I have probably used evaluation more repeatedly or consistently when we um, evaluate end of session or end of program program evaluations, then look at you know, where do we go from here? How do we adjust the, uh, the competencies that we're teaching to? And if we don't believe we've uh, made enough movement in a particular competency, then it's looking at the scope and sequence and strategy, I think. Jody, would you add anything differently there? No, she's shaking her head no. No, I think uh, it, it's, it's really encompassed through, throughout the entire piece of it because as we think about the competencies we're thinking in advance, as we select our competencies, what is it we're going to be teaching to? Well, of course, that's what we're going to evaluate to. Yeah. It's really woven throughout our thinking processes, and it's the level. And Toby's going to share when he talks about the impact here now about how we stage our learning objectives. And I think that, you know, that begins as once we've selected those competencies, as we think about our scaffold and we get them to the scope, um, that begins determining what we're going to be evaluating. We, we do, though, uh, you know, talk about that when we look at an end of session evaluation, for example. And let's say, that, as Jody referred to, the, the strategies might be a, a simulation or a, a, a self-managed activity in small groups. And we might look at that and go, well, we kind of missed the mark on that. You know, we didn't get movement on the competency, but that could be because we didn't have clear learning objectives or it could also be the strategy we were using just wasn't as effective as we thought it was going to be. And that's when we look, go back to the drawing board and say, well, do we need to tweak it or we need to find something different? So I think we're using evaluation throughout the entire program to look at all four S's. But I think most, most consistently, it's most helpful when we're designing the scaffold for the next year program year or for a new program. Um, so I'm going to jump into the, the, the sharing here around really it is evaluation work and how that has how the four S's have I think allowed for greater impact uh, that goes beyond the participant knowledge or content experience that they've had. So uh, Jody, if you just want to advance one more slide. So um, you know you probably are all very familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. This is the uh, updated or the evolving. Uh, set of words that are used in this taxonomy. Um, you probably can't see it real well, but it starts with remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and then creating. And uh, in, in the, the use of the four S's has allowed us to go beyond just those first inner circles to really expand to the outer circles, which is, I think all of us as, as educators wanna, wanna see our learners move into those more sophisticated areas so that they really are retaining and applying that knowledge uh, in a way that's really helpful in any given situation that they find themselves. So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to share with you a little bit around how the learning objectives are created or designed uh, according to each of these levels of the taxonomy. And so we oftentimes start our educational experiences at a very um, fundamental or elementary level around just having people understand the context around that new piece of knowledge and uh, having them think about that in a way that makes meaning for themselves. And then later on, you'll see in the next slide, how we move to uh, a little bit more sophisticated understanding of, of the particular uh, uh, competency. And what you're seeing in front of you on each of these slides is the learning objectives for the competency area of valuing diversity or for the competency of valuing diversity. And so in our 
in our scope, in our sequencing, and our strategies, we are trying to address the learning objectives uh, in a systematic way and also in a way that allows for uh, beginning learning to happen first as a foundation to move up into the practice and actually the creating um, maybe new, new circumstances or opportunities to apply that learning. Um, Jody, if you want to go ahead. Jump in, Toby, if I could jump in. Um, yeah. I'm going to go back a slide. Um, so if you're looking along with that model, remembering would be the first two that are there. Those in the bold that come next would be at that understanding or comprehension level. An application would be those those next items there and so we do pay attention to that and this next slide would be at the analyzing evaluating and creating levels um, as we think about those so sorry about that Toby I was just gonna jump in is why we had them grouped the way we did yeah I want to give a kind of a practical example of, of this with uh, for example any of our leadership programs but you know, particularly maybe with the NEL program so one of the this is not related to the value and diversity, but a different competency around questioning skills is uh, you know, we teach a, a number of questioning models or techniques in, the, in our leadership programs. And one of them is called the ORID method, uh, Art of Focus Conversation using the ORID. And ORID, ORID stands for Objective, Reflective, Interpretive, and Decisional type of questions that someone might ask as an opportunity to reflect on or debrief an experience together. And so when we're teaching that, the first level of, of this taxonomy might be that we expect that the participants in that leadership program remember the words for the acronym. What does an acronym stand for? What is the meaning of, of each level of questioning? Two might be they understand the instructions for how to facilitate that as a leader or as a follower in a group and how they might use the ORID uh, in a particular situation. Three might be that they can identify um, and apply opportunities or ways in which they see a situation where the ORID could be an effective model, a questioning technique. Um, four might be where the next phase might be where they start to compare the ORID model with other questioning techniques and um, models so that they recognize the importance of when ORID could be used or something else. The fifth level or the next level going out might be the ability to reflect around the usefulness and uh, reflecting on how well it went for them when they facilitated it or used it. And then the last one might be where they are combining the ORID, the Art of Focus Conversation, with an overall facilitation process where they're actually creating something new and the ORID is part of that new creation, but it's not a standalone, but they're seeing that as a one method within a much larger learning or teaching opportunity. So that's just one example of how um, in real time or in a real sense, uh, a learner might go through a process of moving through these text to the taxonomy into greater uh, greater application. So I'm going to share some evaluation results, end of session and end of cohort around again, particularly the the, the competency around valuing diversity. So Jody's going to advance one slide, and you'll see um, this is a retrospective pre and post session evaluation from the class NEL class of 2017, which is a class that's currently uh, in operation. And this was after recently an international trip to Costa Rica that the group had in April. And you can see uh, the learning objectives on the left-hand side of this chart. And what you're seeing is knowledge pre-score mean, uh, they're retrospectively of where they thought they were with regard to that particular objective before the program began. And then the, the post-score mean uh, after the program was over, so the evaluation was done at the end of the program. And then the difference in mean and the improvement in mean in each of these learning objectives, which again, they they when they're when they're evaluated together, help us understand whether or not we had a, a collective impact around the competency of valuing diversity. And what we want to see always always is of course an increase in mean. Uh, that's fine, Jody. You can go ahead. And that what you're seeing here is just we also collect anecdotal anecdotal responses on the evaluation, and you see as it relates, we pulled a few out that I think reflect this particular learning objective, or excuse me, this particular competency around value and diversity and some of the comments that participants made. I'll let, let you just read those for a few seconds here. <clears throat> okay, Jody, why don't we advance it? And again, this is the end of cohort evaluation. So we do end of session evaluations, but also the end of the program. These are results from the NEL class of 2016, which was last year. So they were done in, in um, September. 
And again, they're around valuing diversity a, as a competency, and you see some additional um, uh, additional uh, skill factors that are part of our end of cohort evaluation. And you see the pre mean, the post mean, and you see the you see the change in mean there. Um, and again, you see one particular NEL participant's comment at the end of the cohort evaluation. And we pulled these out specifically around the one competent or one uh, competency area of value and diversity. Toby, if I could back up one screen for just a second, one of the things that we notice um, with our programming, I'm going to go two screens back. Sorry, um, is that. This knowing where people see themselves at their retrospective look at where they were at before the session um, and doing that once they're in the session is sometimes people come in thinking they know a topic and they might rank themselves, you know, maybe at a five. I really know um, this. And then they get into the session and they begin discovering that, oh, I didn't really know as much as I thought I knew. Um, and each class is different. So as we come into this, um, the, the makeup of the class is different and it affects how we then need to work on the strategies by which we're going to teach um, during those uh, future sessions. The, the first session is usually really telling for us. We'll get a sense of where the skill level and knowledge um, of participants are and for us to be able then to gear our teaching in that way. And it also shows up at the end of the cohort, um, kind of validates were we on target or not and were we able to move people. And so that it is very different for each class and we look at those numbers each year and try to guess what's the new class going to be like and, and where will they be at. So sorry I jumped in there, Toby, but I think that recognizing that each each audience is different is really a huge part of that. So you want to advance to the next screen, Jody? Okay, and then so this screen is in addition to the competency areas that we're working on throughout the NELD year. Um, we also do a developmental intercultural development or intercultural development inventory, the IDI. And uh, we do a pre-IDI before the NEL program begins and a post-IDI when the NEL program is over. And again, um, it's a, just another opportunity for us to see what impact we're making on the area of value and diversity, but also on just general uh, cultural competence. And uh, again, what you're seeing is perceived orientations are on the yellow. Um, those are what people believe they are with regard to their skill and knowledge around um, their ability to be culturally competent and on the kind of uh, greenish color, you're seeing what the assessment actually scores them on the developmental orientation. What we're looking for is the far right column around change. We always want to see an increase in pre nailed to post nailed around the, the change on their IDI. And so the valuing diversity competency area is one way that um, really helps us think of interventions, an intervention that will be meaningful with regard to changes in the IDI. Um, there are others as well, but um, that's a that's a very important one. So uh, the last slide I'll share here before I turn it over to Jody is that uh, in addition to the impact around participant knowledge that uh, we've seen go beyond just knowledge, but into application and skill building, and into hopefully a level of uh, ability to say that they are competent in that area, it has deepened our own work. And uh, so Jody's going to share a little bit about that, and we'll tell a few stories of how that how that's being done well and when we um before we do that though toby i was gonna post a, a reflection piece in the chat pod so um if you uh would humor us uh, here's the here's the question but i just put the uh, the question in the chat as well appreciate your insights what what caught your attention as we were sharing some of those pieces about evaluation processes and the, the data that Toby, Toby just shared. There was, there's one comment already or question that, that Debbie Lewis has in the chat, you know, what happened in 2013 that their scores were so different. And uh, we can't always explain that. I, you know, we've, we've got now a set of, uh, a set of scores over the, the last five years, six years, whatever, and uh, trying to evaluate and analyze that a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of uh, differing variables. Uh, every class is different, the personality of the class itself. Uh, the intentionality in which how people approach uh, diving into the competencies also has something to do with that. Um, but that's something I, uh, I wish I could give you a definitive answer, but we really just don't know why sometimes we see more of an increase than others. We have a, an idea around some things, and it's, it's things that we talk about that relate back again to the four S's. 
but maybe we weren't strong enough in that particular uh, learning objective during the year or that competency area during the year, those type of things. Yeah, we, we know some of the people that uh, were in the 2013 were exceptional, and there some of those folks are on the call today, um, which doesn't surprise me that they're here because they're in, they were they're intentional about uh, about learning. So that that's has something to do with it. Well, I'll give uh, others a chance if they have um, you know things that that caught attention as it relates to the program design um, pieces, and continue to think about that. And the, the question is in the chat pod there. Too, but I'm gonna move us forward to share a little bit and maybe something else will catch your attention. But when we think about um, redesign, and, and we call this redesign because as we launched into this work around the four S's in thinking about the scaffold and scope sequence and strategies for our programming, it really, um, it caused us to rethink how we design our programs and stage our learning um, in just multiple new ways. Um, it was sort of a, an aha moment for me as I thought about um, in the past, I'd pay attention to what I thought audience needs were, and I, um, you know, we design, here's what we teach. We taught workshops. That's how we viewed, uh, we, we teach a workshop on X, and we put out this list of workshops that we had available, and we would uh, teach to that. And it wasn't that there was anything wrong with that, but what we were, what was happening was we weren't really getting much be beyond awareness or knowledge. Um, or that comprehension level as we were doing that work. And we thought this, you know, we have this opportunity where we're in a program working with people over time. Why would we not um, find ways to, to challenge uh, participants and really think about how we, how we do our programming and how we stage our learning in that way. And so it, it, it really challenged and um, pushed us to think about new types of learning activities that we, that we might use. And it was more than just talking at or talking to or sharing some information. Um, it involves a lot of things like, you know, guided like worksheets where people would have a chance to pause and reflect. We incorporated a lot of reflective practice into our programming in those ways. A lot of uh, multi-hour, multi not just, not like entire day activities and practiced, uh, paid attention to the pedagogy for our teaching and um, adult learning theory that that worked for participants and put the learning into their hands um, had you know them design what it was they wanted to learn we provided the structure and uh, really put it back at participants to create their own learning spaces in those ways it also um, it also challenged us to think about um, the learning that happens beyond <laughs> beyond the program itself and I uh, actually, I'm going to ask Toby, could you find that link to the, uh, the, the Joe article? Um, just to give you a little bit of a sense of what I'm talking about when we talk about um, the beyond the program, is that um, we're preparing people, but do we measure that? Do we track and evaluate what happens beyond the program? And um, you have to build that into the program, those expectations. So we invite people to do action plans while they're in the moment. Um, of uh, learning, but also what are they going to do beyond beyond the program from session to session and after the program is for the, the formal ending of the program. We've also just gone back and uh, actually we did a, uh, as Barb noted, she was in the class of 2013, we did a ripple effects map. That's the REM that's noted here on the class of 2013. And uh, we don't have the final report of that ready yet, but it was interesting to go back and ask, how did, how did you apply that this many years you know, year later? Tell us um, what was the learning experience like, what impacted you the most, what had the, the, uh, the most impact on you that allowed you to do the work that you're doing, and what kinds of things are you doing, and how are you using uh, what you learned? How, we, how are you thinking differently? I'd also invite Toby um, to share a couple other, any other things that come to mind for you about the, the redesign and how it really stretched us. Yeah. For me, the word that really stands out is intentionality. Yeah. Um, in our use of the four S's and, and uh, what we've described today a little bit, it's forced um, us to be more intentional with the learners and the learners themselves have to become much more intentional. And um, that has really, for me, uh, 
I kind of um, transform the way I think about my work as an educator to be really intentional about the way I'm designing those learning experiences. Everything from using of the use of the four S's to uh, thinking ahead of time about the uh, the impacts that I would like to see with regard to the participation in the program. So thinking ahead of time about the action plans that will be created at, during and part of the program. And you know today there's there's quite a bit of familiarity in this particular webinar around the NELD program. And in some ways, NELD was a great program to kind of test a little bit this use of the four S's because you have very intentional people coming to the program. They're wanting to do leadership development. And uh, in some ways, that is, was, a, was a nice, um, I, I think, playground for Jody and I to, to test this out a little bit and, and to refine it and now start to use it in our other programming, our other leadership uh, programming as well. And, um, you know, with mixed results, I would say that it's been very successful in the way we th think about our intentionality around how we design and create those programs. But the, the same level of intentionality that the learners come, come to the program with uh, that NELD has might not always be replicated in other leadership programs in the community or in organizations because, uh, you know, we happen to be an extension family and those, generally those people who come to the program are um, lifelong learners and people really value the ability to learn something new and to uh, make improvements on themselves and, and, their, and their, uh, their system or the program. So, but for me, I would say it's the, the focus on intentionality, intentionality around how I create a learning experience, how I think about that as an educator. And, um, and, and, and actually the whole thought of being um, creating sequence and strategy around how I deliver the program has allowed me to be much more innovative and creative too with creating uh, new ways of learning, whether that's a simulation, uh, an activity. I really enjoy that much much more now because I understand how it fits into the larger uh, into the larger system or the larger scaffold, and that's been really exciting for me because it allows that innovation and creativity to be a little bit freer. And, and when I mentioned the new types of learning activities, Toby was bridging into that a bit. But it's that sense of how do we combine what we um, multiple competencies into an activity that people can practice and apply those in, in the real time. And so um, it, it really did force us to sit down together and say, this is what we want to accomplish. This is where we want participants to be at the end. What kind of activity do we need to create um, that will allow that to happen? Thinking again about um, the, the sequence, the moving beyond uh, awareness and the, the knowledge about it, but actually to the application. So that, that really has uh, caused us to rethink about how we do programs. And now I do it with my, the other programming that I do. I'm thinking about that always, and are there ways that I can incorporate that into um, the training that I'm doing with, with other groups as well. So I invite you to, to uh, think for a minute um, to, about this question and if you'd be willing to share any insights about how you might uh, design programs and stage learning for yourself. Are there any, uh, any pieces of this that resonated or um, will at least come back and think about? Or where's a place that you might think about how you design and stage your learning? And while that's happening, I'll ask Peggy if there are any questions in the, uh, the other pod that we need to be mindful of that would relate to this piece. There is one question, and it's just uh, would like a bit of information generally about NELD. How many participants are in the NELD program each year, and how does one get involved in NEL, NELD? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, again, from the 12 states in the North Central region, and um, each state um, has three spots that they can fill with participants and uh, not every state takes all three and some states then list alternates and they're selected with uh, from the extension administration. Each state does a, does a little bit different selection process, but the names come to us. We don't have any control. So we're, I'm going to do this with a wink. Uh, we're stuck with whoever we get. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun experience for us. It's also a tough crowd. I think um, one of the things that I've shared with other people is there's no tougher audience sometimes to teach to than your, you know, your professional colleagues. And it really has uh, forced us, when we, when we think about what, where I was uh, going previously with the, the comments about redesign and uh, caused us to rethink of our programs, it really um, was that notion of 
programming to that audience as well and really needing to step up our game. And so I think by thinking around the four S's, it did uh, move us in that direction as well. Jody, I, I want to interrupt you. Um, uh, I think uh, those Nell questions would be great. We can maybe take them right at the end. If people even want to stay on a little bit, we can answer those, but I want to make sure we get through the tools. So Toby, could you be ready to post the links to the, the various tools sure. with, with the description of what the tool is along with the link so that people know what they're looking for? So it did, we've, we've mentioned this. And the first one that I, I want to mention is uh, a learning activity that uh, was called Leadership in Practice. And it, it involved this notion of having pre-work. We um, had recorded presentations. We invited participants to watch in advance. That was that awareness level um, as we thought about um, you know, understanding facilitation, understanding process, and recorded presentations for people to watch so that when they came into the room, they had that background there and um, were able to uh, be ready for that learning piece. And we actually uh, provided people then with the tools that they would use. And um, actually, they designed their own process in the moment in the, in the teaching space in the room. And usually, we allow about four hours for that kind of an activity. And so this one that uh, you're going to see there, right now that Toby is going to uh, list. Um, he didn't put the words ahead of it, but it's a, it's, it says UM Connect uh, Leadership in Practice. And that's the link that you might want to check out if you want to uh, check that, that piece out. But we do uh, coaching groups also. We put people into groups of three or four to be able to coach and support each other. We use a variety of activity groups, other kinds of group activities as well. Um, so that the learning that, that happens is done collectively and comes from others. And the opportunity to, to co-learn and co-create becomes a huge part of that. When we uh, think about some of the other uh, examples, I shared the leadership and practice activity. There are other things that we added to the toolkit, and we'll share these with you to add to yours. Uh, one reflective practice activity is message in a bottle and how we invite people to leave a message for the next class about the insights that they gain from a certain activity or leadership experience. And then we bring that forward into the next class to say, here's what last year's group uh, took away from this. Um, and uh, we're able to, uh, again, create that awareness up front with the next class based on the key insights from the previous class or the previous group that would have experienced that. And that's uh, what we call message in a bottle. Another one we've done, we like to have fun. We uh, encourage uh, acting and uh, all sorts of things. And so Lights, Camera, Action is that opportunity for people to play back um, what they experienced so that others might learn from what each of the small groups experienced in a, in a space or in an environment. Um, when we do the large groups and you have 36 people in the room, you can't have that personal leadership uh, training experience. And so by putting people into small groups, um, and experiencing things together and then reflecting back on what they learned to the rest of the group um, can be very insightful and a great way to do that. We also use uh, the Pecha Kucha model. Some places refer to them as lightning talks or lightning rounds or a variety of names, um, but Pecha Kucha is that uh, sense of uh, five minutes and 20 slides and 15 seconds per slide to uh, share something. And we actually invite participants to create uh, Pecha Kucha um, it's called Take Five because there are groups of five people and they have uh, five minutes to uh, share back their reflections on an activity with uh, the rest of the group. And so that's also a tool that Toby posted in the chat pod for you to be able to get a sense of the activities. These aren't the, the deep, long, uh, day-long kinds of activities, but just a sense of how we engage people in those, those places. So with that, Toby, um, I know time is... Uh, near the end or running short. Were there other pieces around that that you'd like to share or um, should we just go to any other questions that people have? Well, I think uh, I'd love to see if there are some additional questions or comments about um, what we've shared today. Uh, what Jody just shared with regard to the tools are really, <clears throat> excuse me, really um, things that certainly enhance and are part of the strategy for how and what we teach. Um, and obviously that that working backwards that's connected to the our sequencing and our scope and even to the competencies they they're just a, a glimpse of a few of the tools that we have and we continue to um, to add to the that list of tools and experiences uh, based on our our scaffold for the year on this particular program as well as in others
The other thing that we found interesting with this particular program, and I've experienced it with uh, one of the others as well, is we move more into this application and practice um, with participants, is that participants have come back and said, you know, we gained as much of watching you teach and experiencing these new types of teaching methods and tools as we did from the content that we learned. And so I can take this back to my community, or I can take this back to my organization, or I can teach this, take this back when I'm teaching. And uh, that wasn't something that we anticipated up front, but it has actually become a, a piece of um, the learning that we now take a look at how we measure to say, how are you actually applying and using? So that was a, another way of looking at this differently too, by being very intentional around competencies and going to those deeper levels, it was having a, an impact at an even deeper level than we had anticipated. We do just have a couple minutes left if anybody wants to get a question into the chat box or Q&A box before we wrap up. Um, I would just add that in addition to the, the, the tools that uh, were shared with you today, um, my hope is that a takeaway will be, uh, as you think about your programs, your design and delivery, um, you'll think of a process, whether it's the four S's or something else, <clears throat> that allows you to, to really uh, map that out, so to speak, a little bit um, before that program launches. And if you can do that with a colleague, uh, all the better. Uh, that was very helpful for me to be able to do that with Jody and, and at the time also Dr. Uh, Dr. D, who was our leadership specialist, to kind of just to be able to map out what the entire program will look like given the, the four S's that we described today. Um, because once that's in place, then the, the, the concept of the, the changes that have to occur are, are only minor changes versus uh, you know, jumping all over the place and, and making major changes into the program. We've made changes over the years, but it's been very helpful to have the four S's in place because it always allows Jody and I to go back and say, what is it again that we're teaching to? Um, how, how, how much depth do we want to provide here? Um, where should that be sequenced in the, in the entirety of the entire program over a course of a year? And then what strategies or what interventions will be the best uh, to deliver on those competencies? So that's really been helpful for me. It has, and I know that there are times when we say, oh, we should, we should teach this. Wouldn't it be great if they this? And then we go back and say, this is what we've said we're going to focus on. Let's go, let's go deep on these. Are there ways of incorporating that? And it does uh, hold us back from wanting to put any more um, items into the, into the package. Um, and then just say, well, next year, let's reevaluate. And maybe we want to focus on a different competency. Um, but for now, this is what we've said we're going to do. So let's focus on going uh, deep in the ones that we've selected. Let's spend our final minute here. Um, if you would address the question from Amanda, do you think what we've talked about today also pertains to programs that occur once, or is it better suited to a program similar to NELD that meets often? My first reaction to that is it, I think it's, it's suited better for a program that's going to have a longer shelf life or a longer duration with regard to your learners, but it doesn't mean that a much uh, a similar a similar type of model, but a much quicker version might happen for a half day or full day workshop that maybe you're doing the same thought process around analyzing and um, exploring a little bit your audience and the and the elements of your program. But the four S's would, would happen much quicker in, a, in a, like a day or half day program. But obviously for a large program that's going to meet over a course of many weeks or months or even years, uh, I think that the value of this greatly increases. Excellent. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? Just a reminder for folks, I'm, I'll put a link to the learning event. I assume most of you maybe came here through that, but uh, we'll have a link to the recording there uh, within a couple of days. In addition to, I think we'll get a copy of the presentation that uh, you've seen here and make that available too. So feel free to share that with any colleagues or friends who were not able to attend today. Excellent. Thank you so much. So from the ESP National Professional Development Committee, I'd like to thank Mark for his assistance in our webinar a couple weeks ago, as well as today. Thank you very much for helping us get our first webinar series off the ground. Round of applause. Yay. And then also today, of course, we want to thank Toby and Jody for spending their time preparing as well as presenting for our webinar series today. So thank you very much. And thanks to everybody who attended. And uh, we hope that you got a lot out of this and we'll look forward to your participation in ESP professional development um, offerings in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank folks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.